The Story of Snow White Perhaps first amongst the folklore which has captured the hearts of young and old alike is the story of Snow White. It is a story most of us were told in our childhood, and we readily recall the ecstasy we felt as we were stirred by its imaginative happenings. Its hidden mystic meaning held for us a strange fascination which we could not quite analyze. The charm is there yet. It is a story we can never forget. It has a staying power which permeates and lingers in the mind of the hearer. What is the magic of this age-old story and the secret of its appeal? Why is it today still so universally popular? It was the fact of its great popularity that led Walt Disney to select it for his first movie cartoon story in color, titled Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and to immortalize it forever in the hearts of millions. Not only in our land, but particularly in Europe, as well as in other lands, the moving picture continues to be a favorite. Mankind can be particularly grateful to the two brothers, Wilhelm and Jacob Grimm, for the preservation of this tale among many others in the folklore of the early Saxon people. They have written it down for us in its pure, untainted form, just as it came from the mouths of the peasantry of their native Hanau and Hesse in Germany. Working together, these two brothers have done a service to humanity which has not been fully appreciated. For hidden within the story can be found countless messages, meanings which are carried beneath the surface of the words themselves, meanings for you and me. Within the fabric of this fanciful tale of a queen's daughter, who was turned out of her palace by a jealous stepmother and left to wander in the woods, is woven the story of the house of Israel. It is the same story told in the book of Revelation and in Second Esdras, retold in fairy tale form. Only the symbology is changed. The message is the same. For this fairy tale does indeed carry a message, and a familiar one to those who have made a thorough study of the Bible and of the wanderings of the house of Israel. This simple fairy tale, passed down to us from lip to lip in the fashion of ancient Israel, tells to us in vibrant imagery the adventures of a wandering Israel, Snow White, and her immigration out of Assyria across the wilderness of northern Europe, through northern Germany, and on to England. Born of the womb of Israel wisdom, it carries with it the message of the prophets of old. It is the prophecies of Isaiah, of Jeremiah, of Daniel, and of John the Disciple wrapped up in one. An early Saxon seer, a true son of Isaac, knowing the punishment pronounced by God upon his people, passed along to us, by word of mouth, the story of Israel and her destiny. The story delights the ears of children, yet for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see, there is an inner and deeper meaning. This seer, whatever his name, may stand next to John the Disciple, so intimate is his theme with that of Jesus as written down by John, and known as the Book of Revelation. Let us look then at the story and see what it holds for us today. Most readers of the Bible are familiar with the misfortunes of the tribes of Israel, misfortunes brought down upon themselves by their own disregard of God's laws. Moses had transmitted to them a set of commandments at Mount Sinai, a set of laws by which God wished them to live. Disobeying them, Israel was compelled to endure the seven times of punishment, 2,520 years. This period of punishment began for the house of Israel with the capture of Samaria in 721 B.C. by Tiglath Pileser III, and for the house of Judah in 604 B.C. with the capture of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. In Snow White we recognize Israel. In Isaiah 1.18 we find a clue to the meaning of her name. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as white as snow, Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. In Isaiah's 54th chapter, we see Israel represented as a woman. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. Isaiah chapter 54 verses 4, 6 through 7. In the story, Snow White is a young and exceedingly beautiful princess, beautiful enough for the stepmother queen to be very jealous. The wicked queen is easily recognized as Rome, or the Roman papacy, 
described in Revelation variously as Sodom, Egypt, and Babylon. Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, and chapter 14, verse 8. In the Bible, Israel is often likened to a woman, most often by Isaiah and very definitely by Hosea. In the Song of Songs, we read of the yearning heart of the young maid, Israel, for the marriage day with the Lord. In chapter 3, we read her announcement. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets, and in the broadways I will seek him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. The watchmen that go about the city found me, recognized me, to whom I said, Saw ye him whom my soul loveth? Song of Solomon's chapter 3 verses 2 to 3. The most positive description of Israel as a woman occurs in the twelfth chapter of Revelation. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Revelation chapter 12 verse 1. The twelve stars stand for the twelve tribes of Israel, as also they stand for the twelve signs of the zodiac, each constellation a sign for the standard of each tribe. In the sixth verse of this chapter in Revelation, we have the basis of the analogy of Snow White, Israel, wandering through the forest, having been released by the mercy of the huntsmen sent by the queen to kill her. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Revelation chapter 12 verse 6. The place prepared of God was primarily England, and it's identified in our story as the cottage owned by the dwarfs. The islands of Great Britain are famed for their cottages, and also linked with this land are the activities of the dwarfs and the little people who inhabit trees and the earth there. They, in the passage above quoted, are synonymous with the seven dwarfs, who lived in the cottage in the woods, a refuge for Snow White. In this connection, read also 2 Ezra chapter 13, verses 40 through 44, and also Isaiah chapter 42, verse 12. The Isles of the West, or Britain, offered the wandering tribes of Israel the refuge they needed. After lengthy journeying, they gradually arrived, protected by the angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth, Rome, and the sea, her subject colonies, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. In the symbology used in the fairy tale, the seven dwarfs are in actuality the seven churches. In the second and third chapters of Revelation, the symbol used for the churches is the candlestick, Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, and the attributes of all seven churches are given. The ancient Saxon seer uses his dwarfs as symbols of the churches, but moreover links them with Revelation by placing in their hands seven candlesticks when they came home and found Snow White asleep in their beds. When it was quite dark, the owners of the cottage came back. They were seven dwarfs who dug and delved in the mountains for ore. They lit their seven candlesticks. Then they looked about to see who had entered their house. The symbols here are identical. That the seven dwarfs represent the seven churches is unmistakable. The first Christian church building erected in England was by the hands of Joseph of Arimathea in about the year 38 AD at Glastonbury. England was the first to recognize and adopt Christianity as its national religion. Churches sprang up all over England and Ireland and missionaries, contrary to popular belief, were sent out from England to the continent and to Iceland. Thus the church grew and gained strength under the protection of God's angel, free from the treacherous treatment it was receiving in Jerusalem and Rome. The church had been well established when the Israelites began to arrive in England. This period of immigration lasted many years. It did not fully end until the time of the Norman invasion in 1066 AD, although it was largely accomplished by the middle of the 5th century. In our story, we will recall that the dwarf said to Snow White on her arrival, if you will take care of our house, cook, make beds, wash, sew, and knit, and if you will keep everything neat and clean, you can stay with us and want for nothing. What better description could there be of the busied activities of the children of Israel, building their new homes, tilling their fields, building their towns and villages in faraway England, 
and all according to God's plan. The church and Israel had now begun to blend. The olive tree, or Israel, and the candlestick, or the church, now stood as witnesses together of God's truth upon earth, as described in Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Students of the Bible know that the two olive trees represent the two houses of Israel, the house of Judah and the house of Israel, and the two candlesticks represent that portion of the church which shall experience the ascension in the closing days. Revelation chapter 11 verse 13. The period of mourning in sackcloth is also described in the story of Snow White. The sadness of the dwarfs when they found Snow White had succumbed to the spell of the wicked queen corresponds with this passage in Revelation. Also, their inability to revive her the third time sounds a deep tone of sadness and remorse. In the story, Snow White succumbs three times to the wiles of the jealous queen. The queen is thrice angry when she looks into her magic mirror and discovers that Snow White is still alive and living in the forest with the dwarfs. While the dwarfs are away at work, she comes to the cottage disguised as an old peddler woman and beguiles Snow White with her show of pretty things. Here the symbology is quite plain, alluding to the outer pomp and show of the pagan idolatry adopted into the Roman ritual. Buying some laces, Snow White allows the old woman to lace her up. She is laced so tightly that she falls down as though dead. In history, this episode corresponds with the sending of Theodore of Tarsus to England by Pope Vitalian in 668 AD. As Archbishop of Canterbury, Theodore brought the church into full obedience to the Pope of Rome and quickly evangelized the whole of England. The services were ordered to be said in Latin by Pope Vitalian and the people of England were gradually beguiled into the Roman form of worship. Israel, choked by false teachings and a display of gaudy trappings, fell down as though dead. On the return of the dwarfs, on the revitalizing of the Anglican Church, they were able to revive the stricken princess, loosening the laces. This awakening of Snow White is dramatized in English history by the passage of the Acts of Reformation by Parliament and the Act of Supremacy, which made Henry VIII of England himself the head of the Church in England, rather than the Pope. 1509 AD. The Acts of Reformation stopped the flow of money from the churches out of England and into the pockets of the Pope, established that problems within the church should be settled in English courts, and gave the king the power to appoint his own bishops without consulting the Pope. In 1547, under Edward VI, England became even more thoroughly Protestant and abandoned crucifixes, images, and other decorations which had been imported by the Church of Rome. A new prayer book was written in English, and its use was a requirement in all the churches in England. A second time the princess is overcome by the scheming queen, whose vanity prods her to try to destroy her rival by the use of a comb. This comb, placed in her hair, alludes to a second period in English history in which Rome regained power. Of what significance is the comb in the story? Was not the hair the source of strength? as discovered by Delilah in her scheme with the Philistines to destroy Samson? Snow White's hair represents Israel's spiritual strength. The comb placed in the hair by the wicked queen short circuits that strength. The comb is also associated with Spain, being an important part of the hairdress of the women in Spain. With these clues in mind, let us examine England's history as it relates to Spain and Catholicism. In 1553, Edward VI died and his sister, Mary Tudor, known as Bloody Mary, took the throne. Mary was a Catholic and offered an instrument whereby the Protestants of all England suffered punishment at the hands of the Pope. Mary made Parliament agree to repeal the Act of Supremacy and England again came under the domination of the Catholics. In order to strengthen the cause of the Roman Church, she married Philip II of Spain, also a Catholic and began changing the ritual of the church back to the Roman pattern. Hugh Latimer, Bishop of Worcester, and Nicholas Ridley, Bishop of Rochester, were burned at the stake, and many Protestants gave up their lives as martyrs to the faith. It was a period of tense religious persecution, a purge of all those who opposed the Roman church. 
England was saved from this second malady by the death of Mary Tudor and the ascension to the throne of Elizabeth. Elizabeth defied the Pope, refused to wed Philip, who sought her hand, and returned England to the full Protestant faith as quickly as possible. By the defeat of the huge Spanish armada sent by Philip of Spain to subdue and punish her, Queen Elizabeth was convinced that God was on her side. Under her reign, England gained a national strength and a freedom of worship which she had not enjoyed for many years. Thus, for the second time, the dwarfs, church, are triumphant and Snow White lives again. Happy and busy in her little cottage, she is admonished to stay strictly indoors and let no one into the cottage again. This aptly describes Britain's policy of detached aloofness from the wars and the disturbances on the continent. Had she heeded the warning, Snow White might have avoided the third malady, which was more deadly than any that had preceded it. This was the poisoned apple, for which the dwarfs could find no cure, and Snow White was placed in a glass case as though she were dead. Long she laid in a trance, and it remained for the prince to come and adoringly behold her and carry her off with him. What was this third malady for which the dwarfs could find no cure? We get the answer by referring to Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. The death of the witnesses parallels the death of Snow White. In this state of death, the powers of the dwarfs, the church, are of no avail. What Rome has been unable to accomplish by the use of the axe, and by burning the witnesses at the stake, she now accomplished by a more cunning and deceptive means. The jealous queen appears now in a new form, and polishes up a nice red apple to entice Snow White. How mindful of the apple that was offered Eve in the Garden of Eden! Yes, she even takes a bite out of the apple herself to prove its harmlessness. Though the apple appeared to be a good apple, it proved itself to be a poisoned apple. So do lies and deceptions take on the form of truth. Atheism puts on a new cloak and parades within the confines of the church, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 by planned procedure, belief in the Bible as the true and directly inspired word of God is steadily undermined. Like an insidious disease germ, it worms its way inside and multiplies and spreads until the whole body is affected with its poison. First, the Old Testament fell under attack. Then higher criticism leveled its guns next at the New Testament. An element of doubt was thrown in first. Men were given to question the validity of the book. The function of the Holy Spirit, the great healing power of God, fell out of style with church-going men. The prophecies of the Bible were scoffed at, ignored. Quite gradually, the Bible has been belittled as being merely a collection of old legends and fables that have little or no relation to life today. By this subtle indoctrination, Christians everywhere have been discouraged from reading the Bible. It was either beyond their ken or unworthy of intelligent consideration. Modernism in the church today has spread like a poison in the minds of Christians, dulling their sensitivity to the quickening power of the Holy Spirit. In this case it was the mouth that was affected, and this is the means through which the deadly mouthings of modernism are propagated. The witnesses have suffered death more effectively than when they endured martyrdom. And so in our story we find Snow White lying in a glass case, beautiful but inanimate asleep to the coming of the prince. But the prince does come. The prince loves the princess, even in her sleep. The finale of the story, which captures the heart and imagination of every child who hears it, is the wondrous love of the prince for the princess, and his determination to take her away in her glass case. But by a miracle, the bite of poisoned apple falls out of her mouth, and Snow White comes to life again. They are married and live happily ever after together. Here we see the similarity of the story with the 19th chapter of Revelation, which describes the coming of the prince upon a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. And we read there also of the rejoicing at the marriage feast. Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent, the King, reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. 
for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 9. The message given to us, whether it be the story of Snow White or Jesus' revelation to John, is the same. We may come to several important conclusions, therefore. First, that one of the religious leaders of the tribes of Israel, while settled in Germany, framed the story of Snow White. The purpose and the success of his endeavor have already been delineated. Secondly, that early Saxon folklore bears out the truth that Israel today is found in the Anglo-Saxon Celtic peoples, regardless of where they may be discovered upon the face of the earth. And finally, that God moves in strange and mysterious ways his wonders to perform. He still has a gentle hand fixed upon Israel's destiny and upon all the overcomers. Israel is being prepared for the coming marriage ceremony when the glorious prince shall come and claim his bride. When that great day arrives, all the world shall know about it and rejoice. May as many as possible have their marriage garments ready for the occasion so that they may enter in and enjoy it together. Then indeed shall the prince and his princess live happily ever after. The historical and biblical references to the Roman Catholic Church in this and other stories of lost Israel in folklore is not intended as an insult or attack on any individual Roman Catholic. There have been many saints among them, and this is freely acknowledged. This writer has Roman Catholic friends who are faithful Christians, but not versed in the history of the Roman Church and its papal domination in countries, resulting in the death of many thousands of Protestant martyrs who suffered for their allegiance to Christ as their vicar.